Sustainable Development Goals merupakan suatu aksi global yang bertujuan mengurangi kesenjangan antar berbagai lapisan masyarakat dengan memenuhi kebutuhan hidup di masa sekarang dan mempertimbangkan pemenuhan kebutuhan bagi generasi mendatang. Indonesia memiliki komitmen kuat untuk melaksanakan SDGs karena tujuan pembangunan nasional dan pembangunan global yang saling menguatkan. Pembangunan adalah sebuah cara untuk memperbaiki berbagai aspek kehidupan masyarakat. Salah satu upaya untuk mencapai target pembangunan berkelanjutan adalah melalui pendidikan. Pendidikan merupakan wadah utama bagi suatu bangsa dan negara guna mencapai kehidupan yang lebih baik. Universitas Syekh Kuala, perguruan tinggi yang berada di ujung barat Pulau Sumatera yang merupakan hasil perwujudan dari keinginan rakyat Aceh untuk memiliki sebuah lembaga pendidikan yang bermutu. Aceh tak hanya sebagai provinsi yang kental akan pengaruh budaya dan agama Islamnya, namun juga telah menghadirkan perguruan tinggi terbaik yang dikenal dengan jantung hati rakyat Aceh. Perguruan tinggi ini telah berhasil mewujudkan banyak generasi emas penerus bangsa menuju Indonesia yang cemerlang. Pandemi COVID-19 yang melanda Indonesia saat ini tidak menghalangi himpunan mahasiswa statistika untuk tetap berkreativitas dan mencetak kader pemimpin di masa yang akan datang. Telah banyak kegiatan yang dilakukan, mulai dari seminar, pelatihan, kegiatan sosial, serta berbagai lomba antar mahasiswa hingga antar universitas di Indonesia. Statistik Ekspor 2021 sebagai sarana pembangunan ilmu pengetahuan serta pengenalan peran statistika pada khalayak ramai dengan membahas tiga dari 17 tujuan SDGs, yaitu ekonomi, sosial, dan teknologi. Mengangkat Data Sun for SDGs and Innovative Fruit of Eco Sociotech sebagai tema bertujuan untuk menimbulkan rasa ingin berpartisipasi terhadap pembangunan bangsa dalam diri generasi masa kini, serta menyadari pentingnya peran data sains dalam pertumbuhan ekonomi, sosial, dan teknologi yang inovatif guna mencapai SDGs. Seminar Nasional akan menghadirkan Bapak Dr. Haji Sandia Kesalahuddin Uno BBA MBA selaku Menteri Pariwisata dan Ekonomi Kreatif, Bapak Lanyala Mataliti selaku Ketua DPD RI, Bapak Haji Fahrul Razi SIP MIP selaku Ketua Komite 1 DPD RI, dan juga Bapak Mardani Hamaming SH selaku Ketua Umum Himpunan Pengusaha Muda Indonesia. Seminar internasional akan menghadirkan pemateri dari tiga benua yang berbeda. Profesor Abraham L. Wagner, Research Assistant Professor Department of Epidemiology University of Michigan, USA. Profesor Hitsin Chow Yang, Research Fellow at Institute of Statistical Science, Akademia Sinika, Taiwan. And Profesor Sebastian Fulmer, Development Economics Professor, University of Göttingen, Jerman. Data Science Competition merupakan kompetisi mengolah, menganalisis, dan mempresentasikan data bagi siswa SMA sederajat seluruh Indonesia dengan total hadiah sebesar 6 juta rupiah. Lomba desain infografis akan menjadi wadah bagi mahasiswa Indonesia untuk meningkatkan kemampuan menyajikan data dalam bentuk poster dengan total hadiah sebesar 6 juta 750 ribu rupiah. Pelatihan software Python akan menghadirkan pemateri Hendra Darmawan, salah seorang pegawai Badan Pusat Statistik Provinsi Aceh, dan juga mahasiswa S2 Institut Pertanian Bogor. Dan Rumaisa Kruba, salah satu mahasiswi S3 Statistika Institut Teknologi 10 November. Statistik Explore 2021, Data Sign for SDGs, are innovative growth of eco-sociotech, supported by Dewan Perwakilan Daerah Republik Indonesia, Bank Aceh, and Bank Syariah Indonesia. Media Partner Umas dan Protokol Setda Aceh, Umas Universitas Syah Kuala, Ozit Radio 102,8 FM Banda Aceh, Sejuta Cita, Statistika Zone, dan UKM Persetuta.
Sustainable Development Goals merupakan suatu aksi global yang bertujuan mengurangi kesenjangan antar berbagai lapisan masyarakat dengan memenuhi kebutuhan hidup di masa sekarang dan mempertimbangkan pemenuhan kebutuhan bagi generasi mendatang. Indonesia memiliki komitmen kuat untuk melaksanakan SDGs karena tujuan pembangunan nasional dan pembangunan global yang saling menguatkan. Pembangunan adalah sebuah cara untuk memperbaiki berbagai aspek kehidupan masyarakat. Salah satu upaya untuk mencapai target pembangunan berkelanjutan adalah melalui pendidikan. Pendidikan merupakan wadah utama bagi suatu bangsa dan negara guna mencapai kehidupan yang lebih baik. Universitas Syekh Kuala, perguruan tinggi yang berada di ujung barat Pulau Sumatera yang merupakan hasil perwujudan dari keinginan rakyat Aceh untuk memiliki sebuah lembaga pendidikan yang bermutu. Aceh tak hanya sebagai provinsi yang kental akan pengaruh budaya dan agama Islamnya, namun juga telah menghadirkan perguruan tinggi terbaik yang dikenal dengan jantung hati rakyat Aceh. Perguruan tinggi ini telah berhasil mewujudkan banyak generasi emas penerus bangsa menuju Indonesia yang cemerlang. Pandemi COVID-19 yang melanda Indonesia saat ini tidak menghalangi himpunan mahasiswa statistika untuk tetap berkreativitas dan mencetak kader pemimpin di masa yang akan datang. Telah banyak kegiatan yang dilakukan, mulai dari seminar, pelatihan, kegiatan sosial, serta berbagai lomba antar mahasiswa hingga antar universitas di Indonesia. Statistik Ekspor 2021 sebagai sarana pembangunan ilmu pengetahuan serta pengenalan peran statistika pada khalayak ramai dengan membahas tiga dari 17 tujuan SDGs, yaitu ekonomi, sosial, dan teknologi. Mengangkat Data Sun for SDGs and Innovative Fruit of Ecosociotech sebagai tema bertujuan untuk menimbulkan rasa ingin berpartisipasi terhadap pembangunan bangsa dalam diri generasi masa kini, serta menyadari pentingnya peran data sains dalam pertumbuhan ekonomi, sosial, dan teknologi yang inovatif guna mencapai SDGs. Seminar Nasional akan menghadirkan Bapak Dr. Haji Sandi Kesalahuddin Uno BBA MBA selaku Menteri Pariwisata dan Ekonomi Kreatif, Bapak Lanyala Mataliti selaku Ketua DPD RI, Bapak Haji Fahrul Razi SIPMIP selaku Ketua Komite 1 DPD RI, dan juga Bapak Mardani Hamaming SH selaku Ketua Umum Himpunan Pengusaha Muda Indonesia. Seminar internasional akan menghadirkan pemateri dari tiga benua yang berbeda. Profesor Abraham L. Wagner, Research Assistant Professor Department of Epidemiology University of Michigan, USA. Profesor Hitsin Chow Yang, Research Fellow at Institute of Statistical Science Academia Sinica, Taiwan. And Profesor Sebastian Fulmer, Development Economics Professor, University of Göttingen, Jerman. Data Science Competition merupakan kompetisi mengolah, menganalisis, dan mempresentasikan data bagi siswa SMA sederajat seluruh Indonesia dengan total hadiah sebesar 6 juta rupiah. Lomba desain infografis akan menjadi wadah bagi mahasiswa Indonesia untuk meningkatkan kemampuan menyajikan data dalam bentuk poster dengan total hadiah sebesar 6 juta 750 ribu rupiah. Pelatihan software Python akan menghadirkan pemateri Hendra Darmawan, salah seorang pegawai Badan Pusat Statistik Provinsi Aceh, dan juga mahasiswa S2 Institut Pertanian Bogor. Dan Rumaisa Kruba, salah satu mahasiswi S3 Statistika Institut Teknologi 10 November. Statistik Explore 2021, Data Sign for SDGs, are innovative growth of ecosociotech, supported by Dewan Perwakilan Daerah Republik Indonesia, Bank Aceh, and Bank Syariah Indonesia. Media Partner Humas dan Protokol Setda Aceh, Humas Universitas Syah Kuala, OZ Radio 102,8 FM Banda Aceh, Sejuta Cita, Statistika Zone, and UKM Persetuta.
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to international webinar of Stat Explore 2021 with Team Global Economic Recovery Acceleration 2021, The Impact of Vaccination on Education and Health. I am Naila Anastasia, a show Masters of Ceremony today. Today, we have three amazing speakers from different continents. Now, I would like to welcome our speakers. The first speaker is Professor Abraham L. Wagner from United States of America. The second speaker is Professor Sin Chow Yang from Taiwan. And the third speaker is Professor Sebastian Palmer from Germany. Ladies and gentlemen, before we begin this event, I will explain the rules of this webinar. Audience should use clear identity, full name, and your affiliation. Make sure your microphone is mute. We highly recommended audience to turn on the camera and use background of Start Explore 2021. Audience can post question on chat box of Zoom meeting and live YouTube. The question will be chosen by moderator, and for Q&A session, there will be an interesting door prize. Don't forget to get post and tag Start Explore for this event today on your Instagram story. The lucky winner will get the door prize. Attendance link will be sent 15 minutes before the event end. The link will be shared via Zoom meeting chat box and live YouTube. This international webinar will be moderated by two moderators. The first moderator is Professor Hidir Sofyan, and the second moderator is Ms. Farah Diba. Now, I would like to read the curriculum vitae from our moderator. The first moderator is Professor Hizir Sofyan. Professor Hizir Sofyan is serving as Chair ICIC Outreach Committee and Vice Rector for Cooperation Affairs Shah Kuala University, Indonesia. His areas of expertise include computational statistics, econometrics, information technology, and big data. Second moderator is Ms. Faradiba. Ms. Faradiba serves as lecturer in in the Community Health Nursing Department, Faculty of Nursing, University Shah Kuala. Her recent research publication focuses on maternal and child health in Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, let us just begin this webinar. I will first welcome Professor Hizir Sofyan to lead the webinar. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning and also good evening for oh, Prof. Abram Wagner in US and uh, best wish to all of us and press to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, good almighty, who have been blessed and graced together in this moment, this event, our virtual international seminar. Let me introduce myself first. My name is Hizir Sofyan from Universitas Syah Kuala. As already mentioned right now, also as first rector for Cooperation of Affairs at the university. And together with my colleagues, 
Miss Farah Diba for the next two hours. We will guide this event as the moderators. Allow me to inform you that this event was supported by the contribution of speakers from three countries, USA, Taiwan, and Germany. We know that we have a different time between these three countries also to, with our uh, country, Indonesia. This event also with the full support from the world-class professor program. Once again, I would like to thank you and welcome on board all of the student and participant to this international webinar. This event seems to be great interest to many participants. The number of participants continues to increase and approaching right now already 430 something. And we also have from live with you too. We as moderator will assist this seminar until the end. Uh, today we will have a very interesting topic about the global economic recovery acceleration in 2021, looking at the impact of vaccination and on education and health. So uh, this is the opportunity, especially for the student to deepen their knowledge about the global economic recovery acceleration. Also, it can benefit other participants in this webinar to gain the information of our economic growth during this pandemic. As already mentioned that uh, we will have three prominent speakers for today's webinar. The first one, Professor Abram Wagner. He is the research assistant from the Department of Epidemiology, University of Michigan, USA. He will inform us later on regarding a deep insights about the vaccination. And hope you uh, make sure you are online through all the presentation. Second one, we will have Professor Sim Chu Yang. He is a research fellow at the Institute of Statistical Science, Academia Sinica, Taiwan. He will talk about the genomic distribution of SARS-CoV-2. And the last one is Professor Sebastian Former. He is a development economic professor from University of Göttingen. Uh, please remain to this webinar at the end to get the crucial information about all of the topics that the speakers will present today. The speakers, as already mentioned, will live from their respective countries. So there will be the time zone the challenge to our the seminar. And we thank you to all of the speakers for your time and effort of today's seminar. Hello, Professor Wagner. I just want to check that we can get the voice and the connection. Can you say? Of course. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Wagner. I hope that the connection starts will be stable because this I morning. I hope so too. <laughs> because this morning in Anaj, Indonesia, yeah, we have a uh, rain, yeah, heavy rain also. Uh, hopefully, the connection will be stable. I hope that you are fine and healthy and also happy. Yeah, I saw from you, uh, yeah, with smile that you have. Yeah, that is the important. Happy is important to boost our immune in this uh, pandemic uh, situation. And Definitely. Professor Sim Chu Yang, yeah, and also Professor Formal will join us later. So, uh, we have a very complete pictures of the speakers. Its speakers uh, will have 30 minutes to present. 
uh, Professor Wagner, uh, we have the operator is always ready for us here. You need the assistant to share the screen or maybe the operator will share the screen how it would um i can share the screen because... i will start okay doing okay it right okay now. okay okay no problem and after the presentation we will continue with the q and p session we will take uh maybe say two and three questions from the audience and this uh, q and a uh, session later on will be guided by Miss uh, Farah Diba. All right, and uh, now uh, we welcome the, our first speakers, uh, Professor Abram Wagner. Uh, let me introduce you, Prof. Wagner. Maybe you can share the screen. Okay, Professor Wagner. Uh, he is now a research assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology, University of Michigan, USA. His uh, research regarding the targeting towards evidence-based problem program and also policy that work toward the control of a broad range of vaccine preventable disease. As for your information, uh, Professor Wagner already published more than 100 articles and also awarded for many achievements. As I know that uh, together with our university, Professor Wagner, you have already maybe about more than 40 articles, mostly with uh, Dr. Harapan. Yeah, Dr. Harapan already uh, read uh, the publication together. I hope that uh, Professor Wagner can share his ideas and also insight regarding the vaccination. Okay, thank you. And now please uh, give a warm welcome to Professor Wagner and the screen is used, Professor Wagner. Thank you so much. Um, let me just start sharing my screen. Um, hold on one moment. So first off, um, I want to thank the organizer, organizers at Shaquala University for inviting me to be a part of this conference. And I'm excited to be talking to you about uh, some of my own research, but some um, ideas I have. And I'm always looking to learn more and to hear some feedback from, um, from you all as well. So today I'm going to be talking about global implementation of adult vaccinations. Of course, this is on everybody's mind because of the COVID-19 vaccine, but there are a number of other adult vaccines as well, and I will be discussing those. And so really I'm interested in, in the global implementation. So how do we worldwide get high vaccination coverage? Um, but I'll use some examples from the United States. Uh, as well as some of the studies that I've done in an international setting. So maybe to start off with, uh, what does adult vaccination coverage look like in the United States? So this is a chart from the CDC in the United States, and it's looking at who has been vaccinated um, against influenza. So about 10 years ago in 2010 was the first year that the CDC recommended that everybody in the United States all adults get vaccinated against influenza. Prior to that, vaccination was limited to high-risk groups. And so what we see here is that over the past 10 years, there's been some stability in the proportion of individuals who've been vaccinated. So the oldest individuals, maybe about two-thirds, about 70% are vaccinated, whereas younger adults have lower vaccination coverage. So this is for um, influenza vaccination. This is a bit of a complicated chart showing a number of other vaccines which are recommended to adults. Uh, again, there's influenza vaccination coverage. And if you um, look at the key, that's this here. Similar to the previous chart, this is similar data. It's showing about 40 to 45% of individuals have been vaccinated against influenza every year. Uh, but there are a number of other vaccines which are recommended for adults in the United States, including a tetanus vaccine, 
um, for everyone. Uh, there's the pneumococcus, the pneumonia vaccine. That's recommended for everyone over the age of 65, uh, but for certain high-risk groups in other ages. Uh, and then there is the herpes zoster. This is the shingles vaccine. That's recommended for individuals over 60. What this chart shows is that the highest vaccination coverage is about 65%, and that's for tetanus vaccines. Uh, but for instance, for pneumonia for high-risk groups, it's under 25%. So this is all to say, I think this chart and the chart in the previous slide, they are showing you that we don't do a very good job in the United States at vaccinating adults. Uh, so, you know, again, we've had these recommendations for over a decade to vaccinate everyone against influenza, and yet we have a large proportion of the population which does not get vaccinated. Um, I don't have any numbers right now here for you for uh, COVID-19 vaccination coverage, but again, that has been widely available in the United States for five to six months, um, and we're probably still only around 60 65% of the population vaccinated. So we don't do a very good job in the United States. And why is that the case? This is a framework which I really like. It's called the five A's. And these are reasons why people might not get vaccinated. There's issues of access, affordability, awareness, acceptance, and activation. And I will be talking about all of these separately. But the first one is, is access. And so that's the ability of individuals to, to reach recommended vaccines. And so we might think about physical access. So in the United States, for instance, we don't really have one centralized location where people get vaccinated. And that's because we have a private insurance company, a uh, private insurance system. And that's very different than in other locations. Um, for instance, I work a lot in China and they have a very robust uh, public uh, insurance program, and they have a lot of community health centers. And in these community health centers, they do a lot of vaccines for children, but they have recently been doing a lot of vaccines for adults as well. So um, that's something which is different between the United States and other locations. We just don't have these community health centers. So where do we get vaccinated? I would say most adults get vaccinated at pharmacies. So um, private pharmacies are where people are going to get vaccinated. Uh, the benefit of this is they're found in many locations. I will say that many pharmacists actually don't want to carry vaccines. They don't want to use vaccines. So there's been a push, um, especially in some older pharmacists, just not to vaccinate individuals. And, um, you know, just I, I know there's a difference between countries and what it means to be a pharmacist, but in the United States, at least, the pharmacist, um, the degree program is, is somewhat equivalent to a medical degree in that there is postgraduate training. And then for some individuals, there also might be a residency. So those are pharmacies. Uh, in the United States, we do have county health departments. So we don't have a lot of community health centers. Those are very few. But we do have some um, situated at uh, county health departments or city health departments. And those do have a strong public mission to promote health, including to promote vaccinations. However, these are very limited. They're often very difficult to get to. Um, and so for individuals who do not have a car or who do not have a lot of time or who cannot come to uh, a place during regular working hours, it can be really difficult to access uh, these locations. So um, other places in the United States where we can have access, uh, primary care physicians would also probably be a very common place that people get vaccinated. Uh, the problem with this is that a lot of Americans do not see their doctor very often. So they don't have a good connection with a primary care physician. Um, it's also unfortunately the case that vaccines can be very expensive for doctors to store. So a lot of doctors actually will be very limited in which vaccines they store. Um, and so, you know, a, a patient might want to get vaccinated and they go to their primary care physician, but the primary care physician might not have the vaccine. 
One thing that we've been doing recently in the United States is to have these mass vaccination sites. So these are temporary. Um, they're also not widely available. Uh, so oftentimes people will have to, to either drive or take a bus to get to these sites because they're, they're not very easy to access. Um, so for instance, I got vaccinated against COVID-19 at a mass vaccination site, but the United States actually doesn't have a lot of experience using mass vaccination sites. We typically don't use mass vaccination campaigns or supplementary immunization activities. So uh, this has sort of been a new thing. And I would say by now, most of the COVID-19 mass vaccination sites have been shut down um, because we've kind of reached a critical mass of everyone who wants to get the COVID-19 vaccine. And there's not much use for more mass vaccination sites. So that's the issue of access. We could also think about affordability. And when we think about affordability, certainly financial costs are important. So money, that's important. But time is also incredibly important. And I think in many areas, time is, is more important. Uh, so in the United States, uh, we do have um, insurance coverage for some of our vaccines. Uh, and for individuals without insurance, they can get vaccines from the county health department. However, that's problems of access then. Um, how difficult is it for them to reach the county health department? But I think time, time, time is a huge thing. This is one study which is just looking at how far away are people from a hospital. So not necessarily a vaccination center, but I think this is a good proxy. Um, so in urban areas and cities, people on average are about 10 minutes away from a hospital. But in rural areas, they're about 17 minutes away. And here, um, the 75th percentile is 34 minutes. So some people are about 25% of people in rural areas are more than 30 minutes away from a, a hospital. And this is if they can drive. This is the car travel time. Uh, and many Americans are poor. Um, they do not have access to a car. Uh, so if you're talking about using a bus, which in the United States, that's not, we don't have very well developed public transportation systems outside of large cities. Uh, this could take hours to get to a place. Awareness, I think is important. That's the degree to which people know that there is a vaccine available that is recommended to them. Okay, so do people even know that a vaccine is available? Uh, so if we take some of the common adult vaccines like a, a pneumonia vaccine or herpes zoster, the shingles vaccine, um, COVID-19 influenza, I think there's wide variation in how much people even are aware that these vaccines exist. I would say right now in the United States, most people, I would, I would hope most, I would hope all would know that a COVID-19 vaccine is available. And I think many people would know that an influenza vaccine is available, but I, there are fewer people who know that a pneumonia or a shingles vaccine, that those vaccines are available. And that can be a problem because um, if you don't know that a vaccine exists, you're not going to try to get it. So uh, certainly this is the one that I'm interested in, acceptance the degree to which individuals accept or question or refuse or have concerns or have trust issues about vaccines. Um, so a few years ago, the WHO has this working group, the Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunizations. There's this vaccine hesitancy working group, which came up with this definition of vaccine hesitancy. And vaccine hesitancy means that people are delaying um, or they're refusing vaccines despite them being available. So vaccine hesitancy is basically saying that if you had access, if it was affordable, if you were aware of a vaccine, are you gonna get it or not? So I wanted to maybe back up a bit and give you a brief history of vaccine hesitancy globally uh, because vaccine hesitancy is, is very much tied to adult vaccine hesitancy. Um, so the origins of vaccination probably come from um, someplace in China or someplace in India. Um, and so maybe a thousand years ago or so, what people would do 
is they would take an inoculation. They would take kind of the, the scabs from somebody who had smallpox and they would give that to somebody else, somebody who had never had smallpox ever. Smallpox was this devastating disease. And what would happen is that if you would get smallpox yourself, the chance of dying was 20%, 30%, maybe even more. And beyond that, it was very disfiguring. You know, there, the pox marks of people, um, their faces just being covered with these scars from smallpox. It was very disfiguring. So uh, there was this process of using scabs from people who have been healing from smallpox, giving that to other individuals. And then there's a chance that that would revert to um, a full-blown case of smallpox, but probably one to two percent or less and much less serious of a disease. And then people would have an immunity. And so this was, you know, before people knew about the immune system, uh, people in, in, in Asia were able to come up with this, um, come up with this method of vaccination. Uh, but, you know, people in America were very Western centric. And so oftentimes when we think about vaccinations, we like to start with this woman, um, Lady Mary Montague. Her husband was the ambassador to, from the United Kingdom to the Ottoman Empire, to Turkey. And um, so she observed that people in Turkey were using this, this smallpox inoculation. And she decided to use that on her own children. Um, and she found that it was very successful. And so she brought it to England. Um, and popularized it in the United Kingdom. Uh, and it, it goes without saying that she herself had personal experience with smallpox. She got smallpox herself. Uh, she was known to be very beautiful, but then after getting smallpox, she had these disfiguring scars on her face. And also her brother had died of smallpox, which again was a very common thing back in the 1600s, 1700s. Another person, um, so, uh, the smallpox inoculation came to the United States as well. This is Cotton Mather. He was um, he he was this judge who popularized it in the United States because there was there was a lot of objections to using um, the smallpox inoculation. Uh, there were a variety of um, objections for it maybe being um, like contrary to the will of God. That was a big thing among some Christian groups. Uh, so Cotton Mather was somebody who was really, um, he was very religious, but he was also uh, politically very important. So he was able to popularize the, the vaccine. So the big thing, though, the big change that happened was instead of using these scabs, these old wounds from smallpox, this doctor, Edward Jenner, came up with actual vaccination um, because instead of using smallpox scabs, he used cowpox scabs. So it's this related virus which doesn't cause disease in the humans, but still can produce an immune response. Basically, it was a way to create a safer smallpox vaccine. So he was the first one to vaccinate individuals. And immediately after that, there was this negative reaction um, because the smallpox vaccine actually comes from cowpox. It comes from a disease of cows. So there would be all sorts of editorials out about, you know, people growing cow parts from themselves. Um, and, you know, don't get the smallpox vaccine because you're just going to turn into a cow. Um, so the, there was this huge pushback against the smallpox vaccine, and that was early 1800s. So this isn't anything new. This is hundreds of years old, this idea of vaccine hesitancy. One thing that was really important in the United States was having a legal reason for vaccination. So there was this Supreme Court case, Jacobson versus Massachusetts, um, in 1905, so over 100 years ago, and this solidified that the government can require vaccines. The government can mandate you to get vaccinated. Um, so the, the person complaining about the vaccine laws was this man, Henning Jacobson, and his idea was that every individual should be able to care for his own body and health 
in such a way as he seems fit. So he thought that, you know, an individual should be in charge of their own body. But what the government, and in particular, it was um, this judge, John Marshall Harlan, he wrote the um, response. And he said that sometimes the government can demand the suspension of, of personal liberty. So, of course, in the United States, we like freedom. We like, you know, our own, our ability to do our own choices. But uh, what the government said in this case is that there could be a reason to limit that personal liberty. And one of those um, limits could be in mandating vaccines. Okay, so that kind of transitions us to the last point, which is activation. So activation is this nudge towards uptake. So maybe people already have access, they can afford it, they are aware of something. Um, how can we activate them to get a vaccine? So activation is one word. I think this word nudge might be a better word for you to remember. And um, basically, how can we push somebody to get a vaccine? You know, again, we're not talking about forcibly vaccinating people, um, like going house to house with needles and making sure everyone gets vaccinated. That's not what this is about. But how can we really encourage somebody to get a vaccine? Uh, so the way that we can do that is certainly to be open to individuals, to talk to them about a number of different possibilities, but to make vaccination the default. This is really important. Mm -hmm. And to also have a system of opt out instead of opt in. Um, so opt-in means that an individual has to choose to get vaccinated. Opt-out means an individual is presumed to be vaccinated, but needs to make a choice to refuse a vaccine. So I'll go more into detail about that. But this all goes to somebody who um, got a Nobel Prize in economics in 2017, a few years ago, Richard Thaler. And he, this was his ideas. His ideas were this, this, this concept of nudges. And basically he thought, how can we make it so that people, people's behaviors are healthy, um, are positive? How can we make those types of healthy, positive behaviors be the default? So this is an example of a nudge, and this is tailored to the COVID flu situation. Um, Say that we have one doctor who says this. Today you are due for COVID and flu shots. We'll give those at the end of the visit. Do you have any questions? That's one option. Another option is a doctor saying, you should have a COVID shot. Oh, and if you want, you could get the flu shot. Do you want to do flu two? Do you want to get the flu shot? These sound very similar. But there's a huge difference in the results. So this one for patient A will be highly related to getting a vaccine because you're nudging them. Again, you're not forcing an individual to get vaccinated, but you're assuming that they will want to get the vaccine. And you ask them, do you have any questions? So certainly an individual could say, no, I don't want to get the COVID vaccine. I don't want to get the flu vaccine but you are assuming the default is they do get the vaccine. For this one, we're making them decide, do you want to get the flu vaccine? That's tough because that makes people, you know, then they think about things, then they think maybe it's optional, then it just happens then that they are less likely to want to get the vaccine. Okay, so in the last couple minutes, I'm going to um, go over a bit of some, some research that I've been doing. Um, I want to talk first about some surveys that I've been doing between March 2020 and June 2021. I've been doing these with some international collaborators in China, Taiwan, Malaysia, Indonesia, and India, including um, Dr. Harapan here um, in Indonesia. Um, and one thing that we asked about is, is very early on, this was last year prior to COVID-19 vaccine um, trial results being shown, we asked people if they would want to get a COVID-19 vaccine. So this is, this is hypothetical and it's this experiment. And what's experiment 
experimental about it. We um, randomized the information that we gave to individuals. So for instance, for some people, we said the vaccine is 95% effective with a 5% chance of a side effect like fever. But then we changed the 95% effective to 50% effective for some, and we changed the side effect from 5% to 20%. So we gave individuals different profiles, different information about um, the COVID-19 vaccine. And overall, across all the countries, this is uh, what we found. Um, we found that for the this is the least ideal vaccine that's 50% effective with the 20% fever risk, 75% would want to get it. But for the most effective vaccine um, that was the, the safest, 88% would want to get it. So a bit of a difference. So depending on how effective or the perceived effectiveness of the vaccine, well, it'll change if people want to get this vaccine or not. Uh, and, you know, I would say early on, we said the COVID-19 vaccine it is 95% effective, but with the rise of the Delta variant and with declining immunity in individuals who've been previously um, vaccinated, it, it actually might be closer to 50% effectiveness. So it's not something that we thought would actually happen in the study, but I, I think these numbers are actually very real. One thing we've actually also wanted to do is to look at how do people's experiences affect whether they want to get um, a vaccine or not. So we ask, asked individuals if they knew friends or family who had COVID-19. So for some people, they knew friends or family who had COVID-19. Some people did not. Um, and then if they did know somebody, we asked them, did this, um, was their case really serious? Basically what we found, um, comparing individuals who, who knew friends or family with a serious case of illness compared to those with no exposure, that there was an increased odds of getting vaccinated. So for in Indonesia, for instance, um, individuals were almost three times as likely to get vaccinated if they knew somebody in their circles who had a serious case of disease. But for a lot of people, they actually didn't, they, they knew people with COVID-19, but it wasn't necessarily that serious. Uh, and what we found is that if the disease wasn't very serious, it didn't really matter. Um, so it's not just knowing individuals around you who've had disease, it's was that a serious case of disease as well? Okay, um, my last thing that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about and then I want to your questions is about, um, is another survey I've been doing just in Detroit. So Detroit is a city in Michigan. It's about an hour away from where I live. And what we've noticed is that there was um, a discrepancy nationwide, but also in Detroit in people wanting to get vaccinated between um, black and white Detroiters especially. So uh, this was before the COVID-19 vaccine was rolled out. We asked people, would you want to get a COVID-19 vaccine? We asked them on a five point scale. Um, and so for people, um, for black individuals, about 30% said that they would want to get a vaccine. Whereas for white individuals, about 70% said they would. So that's a huge difference. Um, but what we also notice is that there's a huge difference in the trust. Um, so for instance, uh, for Black Detroiters, again, they were less likely to want to get the vaccine, but they also trusted the vaccine less, and or they trusted the government less, and they trusted healthcare providers less. Um, and so, you know, 54% of black Detroiters trusted healthcare providers, whereas 73% of white Detroiters did. And what we found was that, um, this is some complicated statistics. I'll, I'll leave this slide to you and, and certainly email me if you have questions about this, but basically about 19, 16 to 19% of the disparity between black and white Detroiters could be eliminated if black Detroiters trusted the government and trusted healthcare officials the same as white Detroiters. Um, 
So this isn't, you know, to blame any sort of group of individuals, but there's understandably been a lot of mistrust and a lot of racism that has been experienced in the Black community. And what we see is a result of this is that there's, there's a lack of trust in the healthcare system and there can be more hesitancy. So with that, I, I've been seeing some questions pop up in the chat. Um, I just want to mention that it's, it's difficult to get uh, COVID, uh, to get adult vaccines um, rolled out in any setting, even in the United States. There are issues of, uh, and I'll bring this chart back, there's issues of access, affordability, awareness, acceptance, activation. All these things are huge. One, I think the things that I'd want you to get out of this is using nudges is really important. My other thing I'd want you to get about out from this is that hesitancy exists. Um, but oftentimes there's reasons for the hesitancy. So for instance, in the black community in the United States, there might be less trust in the government. Again, it could be reasonable that they have less trust in the government given um, the history of racism in the United States. And that can affect whether they want to get a vaccine or not. Okay, so with that, I am going to um, leave it again i i have my email here so that you can um email me any questions you might have but um i really see some interesting questions in the chat so is it okay if i just start answering some of them or um did anyone want to say something before i don't know how much time i have to because if i have a limited amount i know i talked a bit over so if i don't have as much time i can limit my responses Okay, Professor uh, Wagner, I will take over the discussion sessions uh, from Professor Hizir. My name is Faradiba. Thank you so much for your nice presentations and uh, you convey very good, interesting topic yeah, issues in uh, global health implementation of adult vaccinations. Um, if you want, you can directly answer from the chat box and then uh, okay. we will discuss again. Yeah, you can go ahead. So one question um, was about alternative schedules. So, um, and it's about safety of different vaccines. I will say that there's a tremendous amount of safety information. And at least in the United States, um, what we found is that by spacing out vaccines, we kind of reduce the amount of immunity individuals have. And there have been some outbreaks which have been linked to individuals delaying vaccines. So it's not even individuals rejecting a vaccine, but maybe they have chosen to do an alternative schedule. And as a result, we have seen that um, some outbreaks can happen because what happens is, is for a lot of vaccines, including COVID-19, but also for childhood vaccines, you need multiple doses to have full immunity. And partial immunity means it still outbreaks can happen. Um, yeah, so hoaxes that this is, um, so there's a question about um, people believing in, in, in vaccination hosts, um, or they might like mistrust what a vaccine is. I will say I've been, I have done some studies, for instance, in China on some safety and quality issues related with vaccines. So there've been some of these scandals of sort of expired vaccines being used in the market, or maybe people um, like vaccine distributors giving out uh, like saline solution instead of an actual vaccine. I think this is really tough. And it kind of goes back to what I was talking about with the Black community in Detroit, is that you need to have connections with the community and you need to have trusted people who can talk about it. Um, so for instance, me coming into uh, a, a rural community in the United States or me going to some community abroad, I'm not a trusted figure. I'm an unknown person. And so people probably don't trust what I'm having to say. Um, so having somebody who's an, a scientific expert, but who has a good connection to the community is really important. Um, that's hard to create right off the bat, but um, if you start now, you can start having those. And I know many of you, you know, you come from all over the place in Indonesia and in Aceh province. And so you might be really important members of your community back home. They might trust you based on your education levels. So I think your voice is really important. Okay, um, one last question I think is about mandatory vaccinations. So can the government force individuals to get vaccinated? So first off, this is a country specific question because um, you know there are, 
each, each country has different ways of, of formulating laws. I would say in the United States, when we say mandatory vaccination, what we mean is that an individual might not be able to access certain places, like they might not be able to go to a school or they might have to pay a fine. Um, so rarely do we actually go house to house forcing people to get a jab. There's only one time I can remember that. And that was, there was this huge outbreak in a community of measles about three decades ago in Philadelphia. And a number of children died. Um, and it turns out the community was not reporting these childhood deaths to the government. Uh, so then the government did go into this community and vaccinated all the children against measles. But that was because children were dying. Um, and so the government wanted to act quickly and vaccinate individuals. Um, so I think that uh, personally, I think that using nudges um, on an individual level is important. I think mandating is helpful. But to me, mandating means that, you know, you restrict access for people to certain places. Um, you might be mandated for a job. You may be mandated for public transportation. Um, otherwise, you maybe give them a fine, but it's not forcing an individual to get a vaccine. I think that distinction is uh, really um, important and uh, relates to this discussion. So I'll leave it there. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor Wagner. And uh, I agree with you because, uh, you know, in Indonesia, we have this mandatory vaccination for COVID-19. And uh, the result is that uh, some access cannot be uh, touched by the students and also for, uh, by the community. But I don't know if it's a good way uh, to make the vaccinations uh, coverage increasing. Like, you know, in Aceh, we, have, we, are, we sit at the lowest for the... Uh, Uh, com complete basic immunization coverage for babies in 2019, uh, we only have 51% of the population. So I think uh, you also here with uh, Dr. Harapan did the research in Indonesia and your research uh, show that only uh, uh, there is a 15% of hesit hesitancy uh, due to the uh, safety issues. Yeah, Maybe you or maybe Dr. Harapan can add uh, for this in terms of the obligation for the uh, community. Otherwise, we only have like 51% uh, coverage population for vaccination. What do you think? I'll go first, but then I'll let Dr. Harpan speak because um, he's very much more intelligent than I am and will be able to say something more um, uh, better than I. Uh, and, and I think that was what we saw in the United States is that over the past decade, about 55 to 60% of individuals would get a flu vaccine. Um, so then with the COVID vaccine, similarly, about 60% of people have gotten a COVID vaccine and I don't see it going much higher than that um, without like substantial penalties for individuals. Uh, so I, it, it's, it's tough. It's, it's what do we as a society accept as the level of risk? What um, do we, how many people do we want to get vaccinated? Uh, but I, I, I think the best way to do is to just have there be people in different communities who can be ambassadors, who can be, um, the type of individual who can promote a vaccine in an individual in, in that community, instead of having the government do it, because I don't, I don't think for the people who don't want the vaccine, they're not going to trust the government, but they might trust people within their own community. Okay. Thank you. Any additional points from Dr. Harapan, maybe? Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, basically, um, as is usual, the, the vaccination is uh, complicated. Like, um, it's, very, it's, it's hard decision to make by uh, some of the peoples, which is like, I don't know, it's like, uh, it's very, the, the factors behind it is, it's, it's a lot. So, Abram, um, like for by the um, uh, 5A, basically, 5A, and here in Indonesia, we have, uh, maybe another re uh, reason as well for example we, we have like a religious uh, thing that that's really have a, a big impact um in vaccination especially like um uh, a province in indonesia uh for example um Aceh. so 
the religion uh, factors is one of the um, uh, most um, uh, prominent uh, factors that influence the uh, vaccination decision in Indonesia. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Harapan. And uh, Professor Wagner, do you have anything else to conclude your presentations before we move on to the second speaker? I don't, um, but again, thank you so much for inviting me. I think this has been um, a great time. Please feel free if I didn't answer some things um, satisfactorily to you. Uh, I hope you can send out my presentation slides and people can contact me at my email address. Yes, thank you so much. We already uh, get your email and thank you so much for your time. I know it's in the evening in, at the US. Uh, thank you so much for the effort. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we already uh, saw the first speaker, which is really interesting topic, which relate to Indonesian cases, most of the uh, points yeah, about the access, about the time, the transportation, so more, more or less it's almost the same like Indonesia. And we, we are in this uh, pandemic or in this uh, uh, problems together. So uh, let's move on to the second speaker. Um, here we, we will have a speaker from Taiwan. And uh, hello, Professor Yang, are you here now? Yes. Okay, thank you so much for uh, uh, attending this event. Uh, before we start to your presentation, let me uh, read your uh, CV first. Okay, uh, can you pop it? Yeah. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Prof. Uh, Professor Xin Shou Yang is a research fellow at the Institute of Statistical Science, Academy, Academia Sinica Taiwan. Welcome, Professor. And Dr. Yang served as postdoctoral research fellow in Institute of Biomedical Science, Academia Sinica. Dr. Xin Shou Yang is a statistician and a bioinformatician with expertise in analyzing big data and answering real world questions. He researched pursuit to statistical genetics and genetic epidemiology. Dr. Yang extended his research interest to the integrative study of statistical OMICS, electronic health records, and biobank research. Uh, Professor Yang, uh, should I call you Professor Yang or do you prefer um, uh, any uh, name? It's fine, it's fine. Prof it's fine. Okay. Or Professor Yang is fine, yeah. <laughs> okay, Professor Yang, you have up to 30 minutes for presenting your uh, topic and after that we will have a discussion session. So the stage is yours, please. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. So uh, so you see my slide? Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yes, I see that. Okay, yeah. So uh, thank you very much for the very kind uh, introduction and the talk invitation. Uh, it's really my uh, great honor to uh, join this uh, well-organized conference, Statistics Explore 2021, and uh, share uh, with you our uh, work in uh, COVID-19. Uh, especially uh, today is the Teacher's Day in Taiwan. So uh, blessing to all of you and the, the teachers and the students in the world, okay. And in my today's talk, uh, I would like to uh, show you a statistic can uh, address the emerging issue and uh, improve our understanding for the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And this is a, a, a joint work with uh, uh, Professor uh, Jun Ho Chen and uh, uh, President James Liao and uh, my lab members. And the partial of the results have been uh, published in uh, PNS uh, in 2020. Okay, so uh, as we know, uh, in December uh, 2019, uh, the, the first case of the human to human transmission of a novel coronavirus was reported in uh, Wuhan, China. And in uh, February uh, 2020, uh, WHO uh, gave the name, uh, the disease a name is called COVID-19. It's a co uh, coronavirus disease 2019. And later, uh, the International uh, Committee of uh, a Taxonomy of uh, Viruses named the causal virus agent for COVID-19 
as a uh, SARS-CoV-2. And uh, today uh, we, we know uh, in total uh, there are um, more than uh, 20, uh, 220 countries and the territories have uh, reported cases. And then in total over uh, 230 million cases and uh, uh, 4.7 million days have been reported. And the number of confirmed case is still uh, accumulated. Okay. So it's really uh, serious questions. And uh, as we know, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, is the causal uh, virus agent for COVID-19. So uh, in order to uh, understand the variation and the evolution of SARS-CoV-2, uh, they are related to the development and the uh, control of the pandemic. So a uh, genomic information of this virus, SARS-CoV-2, is critically important. And uh, uh, this uh, G said, okay, global initiative on sharing avian influenza data, we, we should, for sure we call it G said. Huh? G said initiative promoted the uh, rapid sharing of the data from all influenza virus before. And, and this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, it has also provided an important data uh, repository for the uh, genomic sequence of SARS-CoV-2 to help people to understand how SARS-CoV-2 evolved and the spread during the pandemic. And today, already uh, more than uh, 3.8 million uh, genome sequence have been uh, uploaded to the GSET for our uh, research. Yeah. So it's really a, a rich uh, resources for, our, for us to study the uh, SARS-CoV-2 for COVID-19. And uh, so uh, in this study, um, previously we uh, first um, uh, analyzed the genomic sequence data of, of uh, one nice uh, 32 SARS CoV 2 strain, uh, which was done low in uh, March uh, 31st, 2020. And based on the data, we uh, performed um, both statistical clustering and uh, uh, phytogenetic tree analysis based on the full genome to discover the strain type and identify signature, so called single nucleotide variation, or we say just SNP. Uh, SM, SMV in each variable type. What is SMV? SMV stands for a single nucleotide variation. It is a single base mutation and different from the reference genome. Okay, so it's a it's basically SMV is a mutation. Okay, and uh, uh, subsequently, and we further analyze um, uh, six two two eight uh, SARS CoV two genome download in April 19, 2020, and uh, uh, also download data uh, about uh, 40,000 uh, genome strains. Uh, it was downloaded from uh, June 8, uh, 2020. The purpose is to uh, uh, validate the, the strain type and the signature SMV that we identify in the initial, initial analysis. And uh, in addition, uh, based on this uh, 6228 uh, uh, genome uh, analysis, we uh, characterized the genomic, geographic, and the temporal patterns, and then infer the aeolytic association. The aeolytic association indicated the association between SMVs. And uh, we also uh, constructed the emergence uh, history of the key signature SMV. So uh, this page shows us the, the data format from, from uh, this study. And uh, you can see for each row indicate one uh, viral strain. And uh, the first several columns show you the uh, meta information for the sample. So including the strain the ID and the, 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 the sample, the, uh, which country the sample come from and the, the, the sample recruitment dates. Okay, and then the data is followed by the genome sequence of each uh, uh, virus strains. So this is the RNA ATGC uh, sequence, okay, or always AUGC, okay. And in addition, there are some uh, additional, we call genomic annotation 
including uh, their physical position, their protein, their nucleotide and the amino acid for each uh, single nucleotide variation are also available, okay? So uh, based on this uh, the data, then we can uh, do uh, this uh, so-called uh, final genetics tree analysis, okay? So in order to uh, determine the genomic variation feature, we initially, we analyzed about uh, 2000 uh, SARS-CoV-2 strain using uh, this phytogenetic tree analysis and uh, together with a uh, uh, SMV metric map for, for this uh, 2000 virus strain. So like here, this is SMV metric. So based on this SMV metric, you can see that for each row indicate one uh, virus strain and uh, each column indicated one SMV. In other words, the mutation, okay? So compared to the reference genome in the uh, Wuhan, uh, the first number one uh, reference genome, uh, if uh, uh, SMV is different from the reference genome, then we will use a black duct to indicate that, okay? So when you see a, 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 a cluster of a cross virus chain have the same SMV, then you will see a vertical black line here, you will see a break line here, okay? So in other words, and the, uh, this SNP marker will be the uh, signature of the cluster of the virus chain. So for example, this is the, the type six uh, virus chain. You can see there are uh, four uh, vert vertical lines here. So indicated these four SMV are the signature for the type six, okay? And the, based on this analysis, we identified that uh, in the world, the whole uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus chain can be uh, classified into six types. So from one, two, three, four, five, six, okay. And the, so this is based on the UPGMA, the phytogenetic tree. And the later, uh, we also uh, construct another three uh, phytogenetic tree. Here is NJ and mesma like and the mesma parsimon and the another uh, statistical hypothesis a uh, hierarchical clustering tree. Um, but uh, remarkably that uh, we found that uh, all of the final genetic tree have the same conclusion that the, the whole gene, uh, the, the virus strain in the whole gene, uh, in, the, in the world uh, can be classified into the six type, in the six type. And the, the, the six type of blue type is the largest uh, groups, okay? And uh, so based on the analysis, uh, so we can identify a signature SMB for each type. So uh, in total, we identify 40, 14, sorry, 14 single nucleotide variation for the six types of virus chain. And uh, because uh, uh, the first one, uh, C241T is in the uh, five prime UTR because it has uh, uncertain significance and that the association property can be represented by the other three uh, SMB. So uh, we just use uh, the, the, the remaining one to represent it. So uh, then, so based on this one, then we can see that for each type of virus chain, they can be uh, represented or defined by at least two of the remaining uh, 13 signature SMB, except for type one. In, for type one, we just define that it's carry zero or one of the 16 uh, signature SMB, okay? So uh, the results of the six type of the strain and uh, their underlying uh, signature SMB was uh, further uh, validated in a, a subsequent uh, analysis of a uh, 6228 genome sequence and, about, and another start data set of about uh, 40,000 strains, okay? And the conclusion is that more than 98% of them can still be classified uh, into the six type, okay? So therefore, in the future, we, uh, we just propose to classify the virus chain based on the, the signature SMB instead of to uh, construct a phylogenetic tree or, cl or a clustering tree, okay? So it becomes a very uh, convenient tool to, to define a, a virus type. And uh, uh, on the basis of the signature SMB that we define, we uh, also uh, develop a two uh, efficient uh, algorithm for the strain typing without need uh, uh, consuming a multiple sequence alignment. 
Okay, so so multiple sequence alignment is very time consuming. So we propose a, a two methods. The first one is we call pairwise alignment, and the, the second one is called text mining. And the using the data set of a, a 6228 uh, virus chain, we find that the, the, the pairwise uh, sequence alignment approach, it, pro it uh, provides uh, about a 60 fold uh, efficiency in computation in computation compared to the multiple sequence alignment. And the, the text mining approach, it, uh, it shows a, a, about a one, uh, 150K fold improvement. So it's, it's a very uh, efficient computational algorithm, okay? And, and also uh, in terms of accuracy, compared to the result of multiple sequence alignment, the pairwise sequence alignment approach has an accuracy of 100%, and the text binding approach has an accuracy of more than 99.6%, uh, okay? So uh, this kind of approach then be, will be applied to an even larger genomic data set. And uh, so uh, today, as we know, already more than 3 million of genome strain available. So uh, computation become a very uh, important question, okay? And uh, another thing is, is uh, because the, the accuracy from the, the two new approach is also uh, quite consistent to the multiple sequence alignment. So the results suggest that the proposed the six type and the 14 signature SMB is quite robust, okay? So it can be applied to a uh, strain typing the feature variant, okay? So the first concluding remark is that uh, our analysis identify uh, six types of a SARS-CoV-2 chain and uh, uh, a certain signature variation in the form of a, a single nuclear variation or we call SMBs in protein coding region and the one SMB in five prime UTR can provide a direct interpretation for the six types, okay? So this is the first concluding uh, remark. And uh, next, uh, in, the in the further analysis, when we uh, examine the temporal tra trajectory of the signature SMB for the six type, uh, interesting that uh, we found that there are uh, three signature there are three signature SMB for type six. This is for type six. They show an increasing uh, frequency uh, in time. This is based on the about 2000 vir uh, virus chain. And uh, uh, in the further analysis, uh, we update the data to more than uh, 6,000 of uh, virus chain. We can see the, incre uh, the increase uh, frequency pattern be become uh, even more strong, okay? Even more strong, okay? And uh, uh, when we further uh, update the data to, uh, to about 40,000 uh, virus chain, you can see that the blue line is the type six, okay? Type six in the world is become the dominant strain. And, the, and also uh, the dominance pattern is also seen in many other major countries with large sample size, uh, including the UK, uh, US, and the, the Netherlands, okay? And then the background, the histogram is the a daily sample size, okay? So the second concluding remark is that uh, type six uh, characterized by the uh, three signature SMB uh, and the one SMB on UTR already become the dominant strain in the world, okay? And uh, next, uh, because type six has become the a dominant type of, in the most countries, and so we uh, focus on the emergence and the, the progression of this type. And the, in the analysis of uh, 6,000 strains, it shows that the, the three uh, signature SMB of type six, then we, oh, for sure, we just call it TTG haplotype. It occurs simultaneously, okay? So the three mutation, they will occur simultaneously. And interesting to see that the proportion to loss any one, loss one or loss two signature, the frequency is very, is very rare, it's very rare, okay? So uh, we are also interested in the uh, fitness gain of this uh, dominant strain type six. So in order to test the statistical significance 
of uh, growing popularity of this TTG uh, signature SMV in time. So uh, the sample uh, collection day is randomly permute to uh, for uh, 10,000 times. And uh, based on the permutation test, the results shows that the, the growing the haplotype frequency of the TTG signature was very significant for the global data and the data in many other uh, major countries. So in other words, the, uh, the increase in temporal trajectory, okay, is not just come from a randomness. Okay, it's just not, not a, a randomness, okay. So this is a third concluding remark that the uh, viral strain um, missing one of two of the type six uh, signature SMV with strong, uh, with strong allergic association, they can uh, transmit, but they cannot persist. Therefore, uh, we, uh, uh, moreover, we also found that the statistical significance of the uh, growing popularity of these uh, type six trends. So the results suggest that uh, this is a much stronger fitness gain of the uh, type six trend that simultaneously carry the three TTG signature SMB. And this could be caused by the so-called RNA interactions. Okay. And this next is uh, um, some uh, people may be uh, curious that uh, maybe uh, our finding of the strong fitness scan is just an artifact of a sequencing error. Okay, so they have a separate question. The, the result is a sequencing error over and some uh, related question about genetic hitchhiking with the D. 614G or random drift due to a, a lockdown? But the quick answer is uh, no, okay? So uh, we do some examination. This, uh, this is an example about the first case, first SARS-CoV-2 case, uh, first the COVID-19 case in uh, Germany that the, the cases was reported in Lancet to, uh, 2020. And uh, we can access their uh, viral genome data from GSAID and they found that the patients carry the incomplete type six TTG haplotype. And then we found the haplotype, they did uh, transmit to other patients in this family cluster. Therefore, uh, so, so this incomplete TTG haplotype is not just an artifact, okay, not just artifact. And uh, we also checked the, uh, is the case of missing signature just a, a sequencing error or not? And in the analysis, we found that a missing one of two type six uh, signature SMV was identified in many different types of uh, a sequencer. So including uh, Illumina, uh, uh, ONT, uh, LT, or Sanger, or Pacific File. Okay. And the second is uh, the missing one of the, or two of the type of, uh, six uh, signature SMV has no significant bias among different uh, sequencing uh, sequencers. So he indicated that uh, this is also not a, a sequencing artifact, okay? So this is the fourth concluding remark that the, the lines of the evidence further support that the finding is not just a, a sequencing error, okay? It's really a, a fitness scan, okay? And the next, um, maybe people uh, were asking why type six will become the dominant strain in the world. Is it due to the genetic hitchhiking with the very famous uh, uh, mutation we call a D614, uh, 614G in the spike protein instead of fitness scan? But answer is no, okay. That, that because the strain uh, with only uh, this uh, D614G cannot persist, okay. And the second is uh, the, the three signature SMV of type six occurs simultaneously in uh, on uh, June uh, 20, 2020, 24, uh, in 2020 year, okay? With another uh, SMB called c 23575 t However, however, the TTG signature was persistent, okay? But uh, uh, this uh, mutation uh, is lost immediately after the sample, okay? So this is an, another evidence to show you that uh, it's not a hitchhiking, okay? And uh, uh, we also uh, use the initial uh, type six chain in each country as the reference, and the which uh, typically has more SMV than the TTG signature SMV. 
and uh, examine the loss and the gain of additional SME in the type six trend in different countries. And uh, the important thing is that uh, uh, the non-signature SME in the initial uh, type six in each country, they uh, lost very quickly. Okay, so the results uh, suggest that the, the persistent of uh, the three types or type six uh, signature SME TTG, uh, they, they can persist, okay, they can persist, okay. So uh, the, the, the final uh, concluding uh, remarks shows that the, uh, this line of evidence further supports that the fighting is not a genetic hitchhiking with a D614G. It's a type six has really have a fitness gain, okay? Okay, and another check is uh, why type six become the dominant trend is uh, uh, people might also interesting in maybe it's just a, a random drift due to uh, uh, the lockdown, okay, lockdown, okay. However, you can see that the frequency of a, a type six trend, they re really have uh, increased uh, the pattern and they become the highest in most of country report in genome sequence, okay. So if it's just a random drift, we cannot see the, the, the temperature increase in temporal trajectory in many countries, okay. Okay, so the final conclusion is that the increasing frequency of the type six uh, haplotype in the, a majority of the submitted sample in various country suggests that uh, a fitness gain uh, conferred by the type six uh, signature SMB. And so we also check their uh, selective pressure, okay? And the find, they, they do also uh, support these findings, okay? And so uh, based on these results, uh, we now uh, in, in the, in the G set, uh, we already can download more than 3 uh, million uh, virus genome sequence data, okay? So based on that, uh, we uh, established this, uh, we call SARS-CoV-2 viral, uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, variation monitoring network to attract uh, the evolution and the variation of SARS-CoV-2. And today you can see that uh, uh, Based on the, the, this big data set, the proportion of the, the type six is still the dominant today, it's still the dominant one, okay. And the, in addition to the, uh, the dominance of the type six, this page also show you that uh, the, the well-organized variation of a concern, including the uh, uh, alpha, beta, gamma, and the data, and the other uh, variation of interest or other uh, currently monitoring variation, okay? So all of them, you can, we know that uh, all of them, uh, this concern uh, uh, variant, all of them are the, the, the descents of the subtype of this type six, okay? And uh, you can see the very high uh, steep temporal trajectory, the green line. This is the, the, uh, the delta strain that get a larger uh, uh, attention. It, it, because it reflects it's a high uh, transmission and the antibody S gap, okay? So in our further analysis, we also find that uh, there are more and the more subtype of the Delta variant already been uh, generated, okay? We have to pay attention to them, okay? So this is uh, my concluding remark that uh, this study suggests that a uh, single nucleotide variation SMV may become an important consideration in SARS-CoV-2 classification and the surveillance. And the second is the, the strong analytical association among the long distance uh, variation, this four SMB suggest a possible beneficial interaction uh, either among the protein or RNA level, okay? But we also need to uh, know, uh, know that the represent, representative and the uh, sample size issue in some time periods of the submitted uh, genomic data uh, still need to be considered carefully when we explain the, the results, okay? And uh, the take home message is that uh, SARS-CoV-2 today is still uh, continue to uh, evolving and generate new variations, okay? And uh, uh, tracking SARS-CoV-2 variations for disease monitoring and the controlling uh, is uh, very important. And statistical science and the data science can uh, play a central role in this kind of uh, emergent study. And the second is uh, uh, some uh, viral variant 
may confer a higher transmissibility and the vaccine gap. Okay. So we need to do some important action to reduce the virus spread and the mutations. The first is a good COVID-19 immigration and the border management, okay? And the second is that we must uh, adherence to the non-pharmaceutical interventions, such as uh, the social uh, distancing, uh, face masking, and uh, uh, hand washing, and the health monitoring, okay? And the final one is uh, uh, try to uh, get a COVID vaccine uh, as soon as possible, okay? It can help you to reduce the probability to infect the disease and also reduce the, the case of a severe, a se severe case, okay? And finally, uh, important things is that it's really difficult to finally to cure all of the virus, okay? We have to learn how to uh, live with the virus peacefully, okay? Okay, so uh, I conclude my talk here. So thank you for your attention and uh, wish all of you stay healthy and uh, all the best. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Yang. Uh, that was a lot of numbers and graphs from your presentation, which is really good because uh, today the committee is from students of Statistic University of Shah Kuala. I bet there's a lot of questions for you. And in the chat box, we already have three questions. And I like your take home message that uh, it's important for us to stop the viral spread of and the mutation. And because uh, uh, it's, it's, it's now not, uncontrolled and control uh, the virus in my opinion and we also need to uh, stop kind of like some border and immigrations management need to be increased okay um, professor young I think it's a uh, noon time in Taiwan yeah so it's your lunch time actually uh, it's about time <laughs> yeah it's about yes. time <laughs> okay now we, we would like to bother you a couple of minutes more with these three questions from the audience yeah uh, let me read the questions questions number one uh it's from uh emmy dayanti uh from Sum uh, west sumatra why is indonesia indicate as one of the countries with a high number of COVID 19 and why can indonesia exit country uh center uh like wuhan yeah so I think that's uh, the statistical questions about why Indonesia has a high number of COVID-19. And uh, you wanna uh, answer that, um, please? So, so sorry, so uh... Yeah, so the questions is um, from Amy, uh, why Indonesia uh, is one of the country with high number of COVID-19. Maybe you can answer on the perspective of um, statistician, because we oh. also have a lot of population, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I think a, a different country may have a different uh, situations. So, uh, but the, the important thing is, uh, should be, uh, as I mentioned in the final slides, that uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, pay attention to the, the border management and uh, how to uh, have some uh, non-pharmaceutical intervention to try to reduce the number of uh, uh, infection uh, patients. So, so I think after and get some uh, vaccine, uh, uh, take take some vaccine. Okay, and all of the action they can reduce. Uh, try to reduce the number of uh, cases. So, so I think it's an important thing that. So, but but I, I I'm sorry that I'm not quite quite uh, really know the, the the statistics about the infection numbers in, in Indonesia. But I think if you uh, the the people in uh, in Indonesia and the, the in the world they can take uh, this kind of uh, uh, good actions to prevent from the infection of SARS-CoV-2, the number will be uh, dramatically reduced. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for the answer. I think we just go uh, to the second question and it's uh, related to the statistic uh, part uh, from Muhammad Nasir. Uh, the question is, we don't know that vaccine development is normally a long process because of the delay caused by many things like ethical approval, recruiting volunteers, negotiating with manufacturers and etc. My question will be, to make sure that the speed of developing vaccine for COVID-19 compromise safety, 
how statistics takes part in this phenomena. Oh, it's really interesting. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks for the uh, interesting and important uh, questions. I think uh, all of the uh, drug development need have some uh, the support from the statistic, the data. Okay. So uh, when we uh, get approved, of a drug can be approved. We need to do some clinical trials. And uh, based on that, statistics are also very important. And, and then the second is, um, now, as we know, there are many uh, new uh, variants still uh, generated. And uh, so, the, yeah. so the, the conventionally uh, drug or the conventionally uh, vaccine maybe uh, will have an a antibody as gap. So for this kind of a study, then uh, statistical can provide the more information about the variation in the world and uh, help the, the, the company or, or the uh, research uh, institute to develop so-called next generation uh, vaccinations. And uh, this kind of uh, new uh, vaccine, vaccine of uh, the, the drugs need, need some uh, very uh, solid, uh, evidence from the statistics. So, so, but the, the important thing is that now uh, more and more genome sequence are become available. So how to analyze them efficiently and provide the solid evidence for the researchers to develop the drug and vaccination. This is a, a very important and um, also highly encourage uh, students need to uh, take the statistical course and the uh, uh, computational course then you will become very important, I think, in the future, yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Yang. Uh, now uh, we go to the live question from Dr. Harapan, which is now available here. Dr. Harapan, would you like to ask directly to the Professor Yang? Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Yang, uh, Professor Yang, uh, the, my question is, uh, this is like a new, like a reclassification or classification that um, your team is like provide, uh, but uh, how it is, I, I, I showed the, the last uh, slide is like um, uh, the relationship with the um, the, the, the strain that uh, given by, for example, by WHO, it's a bit different. I mean, uh, my question is how related, for example, how you can like uh, this uh, explain uh, your classification with WHO, for example, alpha, beta, delta, and 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 so on. And also, is there any like um, a testing, for example, how um, um, you provide the, the information about the um, the fitness of the, the virus uh, in terms of the statistical, but uh, in terms of, for example, the the real. Um, um, uh, assessment of the uh, pathogenesis and also the virulence of the virus, your virus, your virus for example, for um, uh, type uh, 6, for example, uh, in the real uh, life. Uh, you you still, Professor yeah. Yang? Professor Yang, I think you're, mm, you I'm are sorry. still mute. Yes. Uh, sorry. Now it's good. I'm sorry. Uh, can you repeat your your questions part? Sorry. Oh, um, how you can relate your your classification of the strain of the virus with the uh, WHO like standard uh, classification, for example, alpha, beta, uh, delta, and so on. It is the, the first question. The second is um, in terms of the um, uh, fitness or the um, uh, virulence of the virus, especially for the um, the type six. Is there any uh, like testing that have been uh, conducted to assess whether uh, the type six, for example, is more virulent than other virus? Yeah, yeah, okay. So uh, for the second question as well, type six is more uh, infectious. Yeah, this actually uh, because. In type six, for the four defining SMV, it contains a one D six one four G, and uh, this uh, variant already this this variation already been well studied, very uh, very well studied, and uh, show that uh, this uh, will uh, increase in the transmission and uh, the cause some uh, uh, virus uh, 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 antibody escape, and uh, but uh, here we want to emphasize that. Uh, only focus on the, the D614G is not enough. And type six contains 
four uh, variation, they have to uh, occur simultaneously. Okay, and so the, the evidence of D614G can partially support the, the type six can be a uh, very uh, high transmission and the uh, antibody S gap. And so uh, they are more, um, and, and the, but, but the mechanism about why the four uh, SMV should, should be together, this is a, a still need more um, experiment and the evidence to show. But here we just uh, suggest that uh, it may be come from the RNA interaction, but more experiment is needed, okay. And about uh, your first question about how, um, how the subtyping related to the uh, WHO uh, uh, virus uh, vi vi uh, variant uh, classification. Actually, actually uh, they are uh, WHO or other teams. They have uh, some other um, uh, procedure to to uh, to uh, to classify the the virus. Okay, and uh, virus variants. And uh, here uh, our. Uh, the strength, uh, our strength that is that uh, because we combine both phylogenetic tree and uh, the SMV variation matrix, and so uh, and uh, their um, their finding are consistently okay. So I think this is a, uh, uh, it's more better than just using phylogenetic tree that the most of the team use that including WHO okay. And 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 uh, uh, the the second thing is. is we found that in our further analysis, based on our approach, actually we can also get very uh, highly consistent results with the, the, the finding defined by the WHO and the pangolin, uh, pangolin ID. Okay, so I think even different uh, statistical approach, but we do have a highly consistent results. Okay, highly consistent results. But our approach can provide more information about the SMB uh, metric uh, map because they, they, they are important to, to show that which mutations are, are related to the, the variants. Okay, so this is my uh, quick answer to your two questions. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Yang. I think uh, we are uh, clear with all the uh, questions uh, and due to the time uh, for those questions that cannot be answered uh, during the live sessions, maybe you can just email Professor Yang for yeah. further answer. And thank you so much, Professor, Ye Professor Yang. Do you have any uh, statement, last statement to close your presentation? Uh, no, uh, but I want to really thanks for the really uh, well organized conference and uh, many. Uh, uh, staff and uh, teacher and the students involved in this kind yeah. of a, a great uh, conference. It's really my pleasure to enjoy, to, to join thank this conference. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. It's also, also our pleasure to have you as an expert here to share your uh, uh, experience and your study. Thank you so much and hope to see you in the next event. Yeah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are going forward to the last speaker for today's event. And here we will change the country. We will go to further country to Germany. So we will have uh, a professor from Germany. His name is Professor Sebastian Vollmer. Uh, hello, Sebastian Vollmer. Professor Sebastian Vollmer, are you here already? Uh, yes, I'm here. Yeah, thank you well, and welcome. It's really, yes, it's afternoon in Indonesia. And what time is it in Germany right now? Uh, 6.30 in the morning. Six 6.30 in the morning. So ladies and gentlemen, Professor Formos wake up really early for us to present uh, the topic. Okay, before you start the presentation, I would like to share your uh, short bio, please, the committee. Okay, so we here we have Professor Dr. Sebastian Vollmer. Uh, studied mathematics and economics at the University of Göttingen and also received his PhD in economics from the University of Göttingen. He was postdoctoral research fellow at Harvard University, visiting assistant professor of economic at uh, Dartmouth College and uh, adjunct professor of global health at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Um, he has worked as a consultant for the World Bank, UNICEF, UNDP, UNESCO, 
AO and the Asian Development Bank and several other organizations. You can go uh, find Professor Palmer uh, CV for more detail in the Google. So it's already uh, online because he's really famous. Okay, uh, Professor Palmer, you have up to 30 minutes for your presentations, and then we will continue for discussion. And uh, yeah, bitte schön. Yeah, thank you very much, Farah. Let me share my um, screen. Um, oops, what's wrong? I'm sorry, it doesn't work. Let me just reshare. So this should work now. Can you see it? It's yeah. Now it's good. Okay, great. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much for for organizing this this webinar for inviting me to to speak. Um, I do research in um, public health and, and economics. And I want to talk about um, some work that uh, Matthias Klump and Ida Montferre both from the University of Göttingen and I have done together about the global distribution of uh, COVID-19 vaccination. What's like the motivation for our work? Well, the motivation for our work is that the like, vaccine distribution is incredibly un, um, unequal. I mean, this map is like about a month old, but like, I mean, since then, like, like the fundamental differences haven't changed. You see that, like the um, the high income countries are all in in very dark colors, meaning very high coverage of um, of um, COVID nineteen vaccination, and the um, low and middle income countries are all in very light colors, meaning very low um, coverage of um, COVID nineteen vaccination. Particularly, you see that um, the vaccination hasn't really reached. Sub-Saharan Africa yet, only a tiny share of the population has been vaccinated there. And you can also see that in Indonesia, there's, um, there's way, way, way to go, as you, as you know. Um, COVAX was like, set up uh, actually quite early um, to provide enough vaccines to cover 20% uh, um, of population of all countries priority given to those at risk. The goal was to raise like 2 billion doses by the end of 2021, for which like the majority was meant for low and middle income countries. Um, so far COVAX has like, shipped like, 200, a bit more than 200 at the time doses um, to, um, to, 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 the participating, uh, to the participating countries. And these numbers are not, not sufficient to solve like the global vaccination problem. Like, you know, there are much more people in the world than two, two billion, so two billion doses are good, but they don't solve the, 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 the problem. When you look at the, um, the vaccine doses per inhabitant, or the total number of doses, then you see here in high income countries, they have um, close to 7 billion doses procured, um, but the population of high income countries not being anywhere close to, um, to, to 7 billion. I mean, as you know, the population in low and middle income countries in the world is like much, much larger than the population in high income countries in the world, but still like the number of doses um, that are procured uh, very, very high in high income countries, close to 7 billion, and very, very low um, in uh, low income countries, like with like a few hundred million only, although the population there is like several billion. Um, when you look at it per inhabitant, it's even more striking. So uh, Canada is leading the board with more than 10 doses per inhabitant. Australia, more than nine doses per inhabitant. The EU, still more 7.5 doses per, per, per inhabitant. The United States, more than five doses per 
per inhabitant. So we see a massive hoarding of, um, of COVID-19 vaccination doses in high income countries. And um, most of them by now have reached a situation where um, they have vaccinated essentially everyone in their population who wants to be vaccinated. So in Germany, the discussion is not now, okay, where do I get vaccinated? The discussion is how do we get people vaccinated who don't want to, um, which is really funny yeah, and, and very, um, um, at the same time, very sad that I mean, we, we have a situation where we have like many, many doses per, per person available and people don't uh, wanting them. Whereas like at other places in the world, we have the exact opposite. Yeah, we do have a uh, very limited supply um, of COVID-19 vaccination doses and people who, who, who want them. This is both in, unethical um, from like a global justice perspective. And at the same time, it's also very inefficient. Um, and there's like a cost to this. Um, uh, Rand has um, um, calculated the cost of not, not vaccinating. And um, the um, cost obviously is highest, like if, um, if, if there's no vaccination at all. But the cost is still very, very high. And that's like the second bar, the, the purple, if only the, the nations that do have vaccines, so that like develop or produce the vaccine, get vaccinated, and it's still sizable if um, all high, and income, high and middle income countries have the vaccine, but not the low and middle income countries. Yeah? So in all cases, we, we see like economic losses, um, but we also see, and that's more important, and that's not in this graph, we see losses in, in, in life. So like parts of the world population build up immunity to, um, um, to the coronavirus and thus cov 2 um, a natural way, like by infection and by sickness and by death of some. And like other countries build up immunity to the coronavirus like through, the, through the vaccine. And um, as I said, that's both unethical and inefficient. We're dealing with like a, um, like a moving target here. So um, the, the, the virus is evolving uh, quickly um, and uh, changing um, a lot and then spreading very, very quickly. Um, what you see here is like the, um, the emergence and spread of, um, of Delta. Um, so it was first um, detected in, um, in India. And I, I still remember quite quite well, like um, earlier this year in the spring, when the situation in India was really, really bad. Yeah, when like many, many people were infected and many, many people died, much more than the official numbers um, uh, say. You, see, you can see the animation, yeah. gets bigger and in some in India, new places emerged. And at some point it's it's really everywhere. And Delta um, is now like also I believe like the predominant variant in uh, in Indonesia. And there will be new ones, yeah. So Delta won't be the last the last variant. And really a question is um, um, how soon will we um, have to deal with the variant that um, is um, resistant to the to the vaccine, um, which will make our life more more difficult because we have to start over with with vaccination um, campaigns or at least um, have a booster shot. So as of now, the um, um, the, the RNA vaccines like Moderna and BioNTech still work quite well against Delta, at least um, in terms of um, illness, like severe illness. I mean, there's transmission of vaccinated people and that, quite si that is quite sizable. 
um, but um, it still protects quite well against like um, severe progressions. And the question is, will we have to deal with the variant soon? Um, but this is no longer the case, and that will make the, um, the the global distribution even more complicated again. So, what are the research questions that we try to answer in our in our study? Um, so, we wanted to find out um, what principles are guiding the um, the um, the distribution. Um, according to public opinion. And we do know like what principles guide like the, um, the distribution um, in the market. Um, so these are more or less economic principles. Um, but I mean, what does the public think like how the distribution should take, take, take place? Um, so we look at egalitarian principles. So like based on the like, population share, we look at utilitarian principles based on, on need. Um, we look at um, merit-based principles, so um, like a perceived um, like deserving the, the vaccine more because like, the own country um, developed it, um, and then like the free market, the free market principles. Um, so we, we we investigate this public attitude in um, Germany and in the United States. In representative um, in representative samples, and um, these are the principles. Yeah, so egalitarian, utilitarian, libertarian, and merit-based principles. And below are the criteria that we use um, to measure these these principles. E egalitarian would be based on number of in, in inhabitants. So who has more people gets more doses like according to um, proportional to size. Utilitarian would be um, based on like need, like in terms of like how many cases and death of COVID-19 do you have and like how capable is your health system to, to deal with that. So those that are have more cases or have a health system that is like less able to deal with it uh, would need more. Libertarian would be based on number of vaccine pre-orders. So whoever like ordered first and like uh, took action um, first and took whoever is like, able to pay more um, and merit based um, would be based on research and development and production and capacity in um, in in country we um, used an analytical hierarchy process um, respondents were asked to weigh the importance of different principles like equal access for all medical urgency free market rule and production contribution. And um, this was like the scale, like a scale from like um, equal access for all being extremely important to production contribution being extremely important and in the middle all being, being equally um, important. Second thing we did, like we um, asked proponents to divide 100 million doses of vaccines between two countries, um, country A and country B. Um, I should say the time when we have done the survey was a time when people in Germany at least were not all vaccinated yet. So that this was like the time when people were eagerly waiting to get vaccinated. So the vaccine was available, the vaccine campaign has started, but except like the elderly, like people um, above 80 or above 70, like the adult population hasn't been fully vaccinated um, yet. So this was like a time where people had um, like an own need like to, to get the vaccine um, um, soon. And um, in this uh, time of own need, they were asked like, to divide um, like rare scarce uh, 100 million doses between two countries. So we have like um, two countries, 100 million in country A, uh, 300 million in country B, and you have 100 million doses, not enough to, uh, to, cover, to cover everyone. Um, and these countries differed in, in COVID death. Like, so the, um, the, um, um, and the, 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 the number of COVID deaths, like both um, absolute and in proportion to population size was higher in, um, in country B. The um, intensive care hospital beds were much lower in country B, 
both um, absolute numbers and then also relative to population. Um, country um, B ordered fewer vaccine doses. So country B ordered like vaccine doses, um, 100 million with like 300 million population, whereas the country A ordered um, uh, 1 billion um, so 1,000 million um, vaccine doses with a population of only um, 100 million. So quite similar to the to the real world um, case that I've shown you that um, countries have like up 10 or eight or seven doses per, per inhabitant, much more than they need. Um, and a country A is of course much much richer. That's why it was able to, um, to order these vaccine doses. Um, and it also um, had participated in the research and development um, investment and has production capacity, whereas country B doesn't have that. Um, so we, were, we asked people to, to, to distribute vaccine doses between those two, those two countries. Um, in the second step, we um, asked them to imagine that a close family member an old family member who is at risk of COVID-19 lives with them in country A and is um, um, on the waiting list. And we um, adjusted the, the number such that, so whenever they said, um, okay, country A in, in the first step gets like, I don't know, 50 million doses, um, that this person would be at the 60 millionth position. So the, this person would, they, they would need 10 more million doses um, in order to, um, to have enough to vaccinate their, their family member. And we asked like, how many would like change their, their answer. And so how many would like take from country B and um, move to country A in order to make sure that these additional 10 million doses are available in country A such that the family member can get, get vaccinated. Um, in the next step, we ask them to think about themselves. Um, and for that, like an additional 30 million doses were, were needed. And so we basically asked like, okay, how many would be willing to shift like 30 million doses from country B to country A um, to make sure that they have enough for, for, for themselves. Um, in the next step, we um, had like a seven point Likert type scale. Um, and where we asked like respondents for the level of agreement with um, of waiting for three months so that people in other countries can be um, can be vaccinated. So um, so I would be willing to wait three months so that more populous countries can get vaccinated, such that countries with more COVID death can can get vaccinated, countries with weaker health systems can get vaccinated, and so on. And um, and then we had another. Um, analytical hierarchy process um, to, to weigh the um, um, importance of uh, seven study criteria. The data collection was done by, um, by a firm, like the professional market analysis um, firm, um, with the nationally representative populations for Germany and the United States. Uh, for the for the adult populations, we didn't include children um, here. As I said, the interviews were carried out earlier this year, like in May and June, at a time when um, vaccine coverage in Germany wasn't um, wasn't complete um, yet. Um, some full vaccination coverage for most people was achieved, like in 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 August and in, in September. Um, Okay, so what did we did we find? Let me first show you the demographic of our of our sample. Um, so, on average, people were like roughly fifty years old, half a male, half a female. Um, a share, a sizable share, has been vaccinated once, but not fully yet. Um, and um, a share was not vaccinated at all, and many were not um, vaccinated um, fully. Um, education distribution um, quite typical for the for the for the population. Um, employment um, full time, self employed, um, part time, with without without employment. So um, all quite typical for this um, for this population. And this is what we find. We find that um, the. Big, big majority of these populations 
favored um, egalitarian or utilitarian distribution principles. So um, in the United States, 37% uh, said, okay, we should distribute according to medical urgency. In, the, in Germany, like even half of the population thought that. Um, and in the United States, many thought, like one third roughly, um, one should um, give equal access, access based on population shares. In Germany, like a quarter thought that. Uh, only combined like roughly a quarter in both countries um, thought that um, production capacity of free market um, principles should guide like the vaccine distribution. Um, so merit or libertarian based um, principles of, um, of, um, of distribution, um, which is quite surprising because like, this is very different from like the way like the policymakers in both countries um, acted. Um, as you saw policymakers in both places like purchase much, much more than needed and much, much more than the fair population share in those two countries would, would be. Um, and the public um, does, not, um, does not agree with that in, in, their, in their opinion. And what we found quite, thin, um, quite surprising, um, and I didn't have like a strong expectation there what to expect, that like um, the countries are relatively similar. So the, um, the answers in, in Germany and the United States are not dramatically dramatically different. So of course we see this difference between equal access and medical urgency between the two, two countries. But, um, um, but overall, I mean, I find this rather, rather similar. So let's move to the, to the second question. Like, so um, how, many, how would you um, allocate the vaccine doses to, um, to, to other countries? Um, so in Germany, um, people um, would allocate um, 58 uh, million doses uh, to uh, country B in the United States, 50, 54. So they would give a majority to, um, to country B, but they would not give um, um, based on population share. I mean, country B is like um, three times larger than country A. Um, so um, if you divide it according to population share, country B um, should have like 75 million doses um, and they got like 58 and 54, um, 54 million. Um, but they of course give much more than based on production capacity or like um, willingness or ability to pay um, would be given. Um, when you see like um, how many would change in their, um, their, their answer, um, if, um, like either family member or themselves like are affected and um, the veil of ignorance is removed and they um, know, okay, I need um, so and so many doses like for my, um, for my own, then um, you see the numbers reduce a bit, um, but not dramatically. And then the share um, changing their um, response is relatively small. Um, we um, allowed respondents to um, also justify their, their choice. Um, and these are some examples of responses we got. Um, um, I still believe the fairness thing, the fairest thing to do is to split the surprise evenly between the two countries that, that, that need them. Um, Wealthy individuals have a better chance of not contracting the disease, while poorer countries would have a larger rate of transmission to more people. Um, the old person, the more well-off country can take measures, people in country B wouldn't be able to take as easily. Um, I could protect an older relative by keep, keeping them at home, whereas um, other people have don't have that choice. Um, and, and a few more examples you see here on this uh, slide. I chose the same distribution as for the previous question because I had already considered the risk for those standing by in the attempt to distribute it in a meaningful and fair manner, your own interest cannot take precedence. And so these are what people, people said. Um, as, um, again, like it's a contrast to um, what the um, action in these countries looks like. Um, here you see the um, the criteria that um, according to which um, people would be willing to vaccinate like three months longer um, in order to uh, make sure that other countries have a fair shot too. And um, there you see the, um, 
the, the blue colored criteria. So according to medical need, uh, the ones that are considered most important, followed by the um, egalitarian, like the proportional to size criteria um, uh, to the left, followed by the merit-based criteria according to research and development and production to the right. What we see here is that the merit-based criteria in the United States um, are um, a bit more important than they are in, in, in Germany. The utilitarian criteria are the, the, the ones considered least important. So our final analytical hierarchy and process um, we see that like um, and health systems capacity and need, uh, so the first two, like death and ICU beds, um, are um, considered very important distribution criteria. Then um, R&D um, and production capacity um, together also quite important. Um, Pre-order and GDP, relatively small and, and population size also relatively small. So you see, if you ask people this way, um, with like the, the criteria directly, um, you get like slightly different um, responses than you got in the, in the very um, beginning when I showed you the uh, criteria first. This is summarized in this, um, in this step, but it's not dramatically different. Yeah? So you see that still medical urgencies um, plays a big role in, the, in Germany, also a sizable role in the United States, and together with like um, equal access criteria, uh, population rating, um, these two are the predominant um, distribution criteria according to the public opinion in these two countries. Again, in stark contrast with like the action of um, of of, um, of policy, political decision makers that order much more than um, the uh, countries um, need. Um, here you see a ranking like, of all the criteria. In all cases, GDP is considered like the least important, um, and um, the medical need is uh, considered the most important, which is I think quite re reassuring. Um, we uh, checked um, the uh, results for the possibility of, um, of social desirability bias. Um, we did not find any evidence for social desirability bias in Germany. Um, uh, in the United States, there was like, some evidence um, for social desirability bias um, choosing utilitarian um, principles, but um, not, not a whole, whole lot. So we are quite confident that, that these um, findings like, are not due to social desirability bias, but really reflect the um, opinion of the public in both um, both 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 countries. Um, so, what do we conclude? We conclude that um, high um, number of death and low number of um, ICU beds, so um, limited health system and capacity received the largest rating in these two populations in the United States and um, in Germany for distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. This was followed by a number of inhabitants, then merit based on production and research and development. And then last and least important was market rule libertarian principles. Um, so our findings indicate that the public in the United States and Germany have a good understanding that the fight against um, COVID-19 is a global one and um, it requires prioritizing according to medical urgency because that's really what's, um, um, what's like the key challenge now. Um, if um, let's say Germany um, vaccinates its own um, population, um, then that doesn't mean that the Germany is protected. Yeah, so um, because um, if we still have large parts of the population not, not vaccinated, um, chances are high that like a variant will emerge and sooner or later it will be a variant that um, is able to beat the vaccine. So um, it's not only an ethical and fairness question, um, and I think the ethical and fairness question is, is quite clear. It's unethical the way like vaccines are currently distributed in the world and it's unfair, but it's also an efficiency question. Yeah, so we will not um, defeat um, the, the, the virus. We will not end the pandemic before we defeat it everywhere, before we have ended it everywhere. Um, as long as there are 
like large pockets of unvaccinated people anywhere in the world, um, the um, virus has the possibility of um, um, of um, developing further and of um, um, of um, of um, of mutating and, um, and and growing stronger and stronger. Um, and a situation where you have many people vaccinated and many people not vaccinated is quite quite favorable. Um, for that, so we have to to um, to to avoid that, and therefore, and this is not only like an ethics and fairness question, which it is, and I think that's really important. It's also an efficiency um, question, and um, we see this contrast between public perception and like political action in these in, in these countries. And with our research and our findings, we want to point um, um, public opinion and like also policymakers' attention to this important question of global um, fairness in the um, in the COVID nineteen vaccine distribution. I thank you very much for your um, attention, and I look forward to the um, to the discussion. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Fulmer. Uh, it's really nice to hear your experience and research uh, comparing Germany and the US. Um, I just wonder how many percentage of the coverage, vaccinations coverage in Germany right now? Um, so um, the, um, the rate is like, um, around, um, I, I think, 65 percent oh, or so 65 um, but, but it's not that high i mean but um you have to keep in mind that like there is still no vaccine for kids under 12 and mm. the um approval for kids like let's say between like 18 and 12 has been only made very recently um mm. so and if you just like um, account like the adult population it's much higher than 65 um, um, per percent but we're definitely at a point now uh, where everyone who wants um, uh, can get vaccinated and the people who are not vaccinated yet are people who made a choice that they didn't want to so mm. um, the government has made an offer to everyone in the population to um, to, to get vaccinated a, a while ago and some people Uh, chose to uh, not take up that mm -hmm. that that offer and the, the low number i mean is to to some extent driven by, by children not being included yet yeah are you uh, using pfizer or do you have various kind of vaccination in germany for the community um, so um the vaccines to my knowledge that are approved um, for use in germany and the eu are the uh, the biontech moderna um, the, the pfizer which was developed in germany um, at, um, at by biontech um, and produced by pfizer in, in the united states uh, moderna um, oh, yeah. which was developed in the us uh, astrazeneca and uh, johnson johnson are the four that are, um, are being used Yeah, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, you can hear that the people in Germany also use AstraZeneca. So do not worry for uh, using AstraZeneca and Moderna. Yeah? Okay, Professor Fulmer, now we go forward to the questions uh, from the audience. Uh, our audience here are mostly students from statistics faculty and also some uh, other lecturer. And also there, also there is a high school student. Okay, let's go first to see the first question. Here is from, um, yeah, I will choose the one that it's related to the topic. Um, from Seftiani, uh, she asked, the implementation of the National Economic Recovery Program has the potential to face various challenge in the field including in terms of hierarchy, the risk of fraud, and the occurrence of corruption. In mm. your opinion, how is, how is strengthening government as the core of economic recovery and how to support civil society organization and mm. think, think tank to help see the impact or outcomes at the macro level? Mm. That's a difficult question, and I'm not really like an expert on, on this. I should just say that like corruption and problems like this are problems that you face everywhere. So in Germany, we had yeah. like a big scandal with like members of parliament that would um, arrange like deals like for trading um, like face masks, like um, like mouth mouth nose coverage, 
mm -hmm. they would like, earn like millions of um, of euro uh, doing this as members of parliament. And mm -hmm. the, the thing that worked here is that like the public held them accountable. So like this became public knowledge. Like, it was like on the news, um, and they were. Um, and I mean, in, in the end, they had to resign. Yeah, and they're no longer members of parliament because they 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 did this. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's something that that works. Like so, transparency, um, and making sure that people who um, who enrich themselves like in this time of like need of the population that they're held accountable and that the public knows about it. And I mean, yes, now they they have. Um, 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 they have a few more million. They they didn't have to pay back the money. Uh, they they still have the money, but like the public now thinks that they are really like, shameful people um, that I mean have um, have done really bad things um, and um, and they have lost like all their respect and like like what's um, what's like a lot of money if like no one is respecting you anymore because you have done this horrible thing. Yeah. Um, so I think that that can help. Um, but I mean, you should know this uh, corruption is not, I mean, it's a problem everywhere in the world and, and we had this problem, problem too. Okay. Um, I think we we'll just go to the second question and it's related to the topic uh, about your research. Uh, there's a question from Fahmi. Uh, do you share your research result to policymaker or decision maker in your country? If you do, how do you ensure that they will consider implement this result or it's just a publication paper? So we um, uh, we have made this this public and we are talking about it. Um, in the end, like we do not know what policymakers make with what policymakers make of it. Uh, please, uh, operator, can you mute the participants' microphone? Thank you. Okay, Professor Palmer. Um, operator, um, can you help? Okay, now it's clear. Uh, please okay. go ahead, Professor Palmer. Um, so, in this is not in our, I mean, our reach really. Yeah. So, I mean, we can only as um, as researchers tell decision makers like what we find, and we can give recommendations. But in the end, like it's a political decision, and I mean, we, we as researchers do not make the decision ourselves, and we cannot force the decision makers to make the decision. And that's something that I have to to accept. So um, when you ask me, what do I do to ensure that they do it? Then the answer is, well, I try to um, give good arguments. And if um, they uh, agree with the good arguments, then fine. And if not, then that's what it is. Yeah, so I think we already did our part as a researcher and uh, we give recommendation to the government and other stakeholders just to uh, we are we all together in this, so we all together do our part uh, to contribute so then we can exit this pandemic, yeah. So um, thank you. And the last question maybe, uh, due to time, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot read all your questions and maybe you can uh, post the questions to the committee and committee can forward this question to the speakers. So I will choose the last question. For Professor Volmer is from Wahyu Okta Perdana from University of Riau. Uh, I want to ask about most COVID infection information is focused on how effective they are at preventing serious diseases, hospitalization and death. How is it possible that the vaccine is more effective at preventing serious illness and death that, than it is preventing a mild infection? And how effective are vaccine at preventing long haul COVID? And then in the aspect of education, if the COVID-19 pandemic were finished someday, was the blended learning model for students were the best solution Then will be permanently applied in here? So this hmm. is actually two questions. Uh, maybe you can answer one by one. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, regarding the, the vaccine, like, I mean, I'm not a medical doctor, I'm not a medical um, expert, so I'm an economist and public health uh, researcher. So um, regarding the effectiveness of the vaccine, I can only tell you what I also read from studies. Mm -hmm. And this is that they all protect very well against um, severe disease progressions. 
So they protect you from getting very, very sick and they protect you from dying. They also protect, I mean, in the beginning, they also protected um, from transmission, from infections. Um, but with like the new variants emerging, that's no longer the case to the extent um, that we saw in the beginning with, uh, um, with, the, with the wild type. Yeah? With, with Delta, we, um, we see quite a bit of, um, of, um, of transmission. Um, like, so the virus is like, spreading from vaccinated to vaccinated people or from vaccinated to unvaccinated people. Um, but for me personally, I don't think that's such a big, big deal. Of course, that makes it more difficult to, to contain it. Yeah, but if like everyone is like protected from getting really sick and from dying, that's to me what counts. And, um, and that like the vaccines like achieve. Um, of course, I mean, if, um, if we had a vaccine um, that like um, um, would also prevent transmission fully, would be much easier to achieve herd immunity at some extent, at some point. Um, and it's very difficult or impossible to achieve herd immunity with like a vaccine um, that allows transmission. But okay, that's what it is. I mean, we, we, we have like vaccines that protect us from getting sick or from, from dying and that's, and that's a lot. And, and that's really important. So I, mean, I, I hope that everyone will have access to this and will be protected from getting sick and from, from dying. Um, soon, and that's what counts to me. Um, regarding uh, education, and I think, and we, um, I mean, some of this, like, of this digital learning, um, we we should uh, continue after um, after the pandemic is um, is over. But I mean, uh, for my part, I can say that I also look forward to going back to the classroom and to interacting with like, students in person. Um, because it doesn't work so well on 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 on, on Zoom, yeah. So like um, like learning and teaching is not just like like a professor talking to the students and the students are listening. That you can do um, in Zoom um, as um, as well. Um, it um, also the interaction and the discussion and the communication is really important, and, and that um, doesn't work so well in my experience, like in, in these like, virtual formats. Um, I see that Pakistan's hand is up. Oh, sorry, I didn't see it. Uh, who who raised hand? Professor, who, Dr. Ihsan? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ihsan. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wondering one question to Professor Folmer. First of all, thank you for your nice presentation. It really gives us uh, new insights about the vaccination program. Uh, I have two questions, actually. First, um, uh, do you have any adverse event as a side effect of vaccination in Germany, for example, like blood clotting or something yes. else? Uh, and the second, uh, does your government prefer one uh, vaccine over the others? I mean, one brand of vaccine over the others or just the same, uh, all of it? Thank you. Yeah, um, so we, we had like, I mean, with, with any vaccine, like really any vaccine, you have like some adverse events, but like the, the rate at which these adverse events occurred was really, 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 really small. Um, so the, the risk, I mean, the potential damage from these adverse events like compared to the potential damage from, from COVID is quite clear um, that the damage from COVID is much, much more severe. But what happened in, in, in Germany, for instance, is that these, um, these um, blood clottings were most common among younger women. And therefore the um, recommendation, and, and they were most common with, with the AstraZeneca vaccine um, actually. Um, so the, um, the, um, the national authority changed the recommendation to not use um, that vaccine for, for younger women. Um, and instead um, using the, um, the Moderna and BioNTech um, vaccine for, 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 for them. Um, whereas for, for older people, um, this didn't have, this wasn't the case and the recommendation wasn't changed. Oh, sorry, Professor Palmer, I think uh, yours is muted, sorry. Oh, sorry, the operator, I think, muted me. Yes. Yeah. Um, the um, so this was a very controversial debate in in, in Germany because I mean really like um, even for for those that experience I mean, the, the 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 share like the rate of these adverse events was like so so rare 
that you know, some people argued, and I think rightly so, that I mean, compared to the risk of COVID, um, it's not such a big deal. Um, but then given that like people had a choice, yeah, so and like for, for some vaccines, you didn't have these adverse events, um, then um, the um, um, said, okay, then let's give the other vaccine to these, um, to these people. Um, but as you know, like, um, for instance, in, in Israel, there were also some adverse events with like the, the BioNTech uh, Pfizer um, vaccine. Um, so I think for any vaccine, there are some adverse events, it's normal. But um, for all of them, the, the rates are, are relative, I mean, are small. I mean, yes, there is like a risk, um, but like the risk is really, really small. And compared to the risk of COVID, it's, um, it's definitely less. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ihsan, and also thank you, Professor Fulmer, for all the answer. And I totally agree with you that during this pandemic, uh, our human connection as a lecturer and students and uh, social interactions is getting less and um, um, really not connected. So I think it's really good that uh, this um, mixed method like having this online sometimes and having the class uh, offline sometimes will help the connection between the lecturer and the students to convey the, uh, the topics. And we also uh, can uh, use kind of like virtual uh, lecturer in some uh, cases, yeah. So Professor Fulmer, do you have anything to say before the, uh, to, to close the presentation before we close all this event? Um, I just uh, thank you for organizing this and uh, thanks everyone for the questions and the discussion and I wish you all the best for um, for this and future future events. So thank you. It was very insightful. Thank you so much. We also say thank you for you because you wake up uh, really early for this event and thank you for sharing us this topic. It's really interesting. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we already... Uh, at the end of this uh, event. So um, I would like to say thank you for all dear students, the committee, the sponsors, and uh, all the audience. Uh, we, come, we come to the end of this session. So we had an interesting topic and discussion from all these um, three excellent speakers from the United States of America, from Taiwan, and from Germany. I'm very happy to be the moderator for this event. And I hope that uh, you gather some new insight especially for the students, some lessons learned and experience from our three speakers, yeah. And I will give back uh, this microphone, the stage to the MC to close our webinar. So see you at the uh, next time and next occasions. Goodbye. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alaikum salam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, finally, we come to the end of this event. Before we close the event, I will announce six lucky person who asked the best question and post the best Instagram story. The lucky participants will be contacted by our committee. And here's the name. First, congratulations to Aurel Hewi Sabita. Second, congratulations to Cecilia Winda Prastia. The third, congratulations to Hedwiges Jessica Santoso. And fourth, congratulations to Muhammad Nasir. Fifth, congratulations to Dr. Harapan. 
And six, congratulations to Wahyu Okta Perdana. Congratulations to all the winners. Once again, please stay online after the event so our committee will contact you. Uh, sorry, uh, Naila, I think your, mute, uh, her, your mic is muted. Okay, my mistakes. Ladies and gentlemen, to cheers our moment, let's us now taking some pictures. And for that, please turn on your camera. The operator will eat this. Okay, you can active your camera and we will take picture in one, two, three. Thank you. I am MC of this webinar on behalf of the committee would like to say thank you so much to all the amazing speakers, moderators, and all the participants. Hope to see you soon in the next event. Hope you can always learn and get a good side from today's webinar. Stay healthy and be happy. Wabilahi taufiq wa hidayah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Sustainable Development Goals merupakan suatu aksi global yang bertujuan mengurangi kesenjangan antar berbagai lapisan masyarakat dengan memenuhi kebutuhan hidup di masa sekarang dan mempertimbangkan pemenuhan kebutuhan bagi generasi mendatang. Indonesia memiliki komitmen kuat untuk melaksanakan SDGs karena tujuan pembangunan nasional dan pembangunan global yang saling menguatkan. Pembangunan adalah sebuah cara untuk memperbaiki berbagai aspek kehidupan masyarakat. Salah satu upaya untuk mencapai target pembangunan berkelanjutan adalah melalui pendidikan. Pendidikan merupakan wadah utama bagi suatu bangsa dan negara guna mencapai kehidupan yang lebih baik. Universitas Syekh Kuala, perguruan tinggi yang berada di ujung barat Pulau Sumatera yang merupakan hasil perwujudan dari keinginan rakyat Aceh untuk memiliki sebuah lembaga pendidikan yang bermutu. Aceh tak hanya sebagai provinsi yang kental akan pengaruh budaya dan agama Islamnya, namun, juga telah menghadirkan perguruan tinggi terbaik yang dikenal dengan jantung hati rakyat Aceh. Perguruan tinggi ini telah berhasil mewujudkan banyak generasi emas penerus bangsa menuju Indonesia yang cemerlang. Pandemi COVID-19 yang melanda Indonesia saat ini tidak menghalangi himpunan mahasiswa statistika untuk tetap berkreativitas dan mencetak kader pemimpin di masa yang akan datang. Telah banyak kegiatan yang dilakukan, mulai dari seminar, pelatihan, kegiatan sosial, serta berbagai lomba antar mahasiswa hingga antar universitas di Indonesia. Statistik Ekspor 2021 sebagai sarana pembangunan ilmu pengetahuan serta pengenalan peran statistika pada khalayak ramai dengan membahas tiga dari 17 tujuan SDGs, yaitu ekonomi, sosial, dan teknologi. Mengangkat Data Sun for SDGs and Innovative Fruit of Eco Sociotech sebagai tema bertujuan untuk menimbulkan rasa ingin berpartisipasi terhadap pembangunan bangsa dalam diri generasi masa kini, serta menyadari pentingnya peran data sains dalam pertumbuhan ekonomi, sosial, dan teknologi yang inovatif guna mencapai SDGs. Seminar Nasional akan menghadirkan Bapak Dr. Haji Sandi Kesalahuddin Uno BBA MBA selaku Menteri Pariwisata dan Ekonomi Kreatif, Bapak Lanyala Mataliti selaku Ketua DPD RI, Bapak Haji Fahrul Razi SIPMIP selaku Ketua Komite 1 DPD RI, dan juga Bapak Mardani Hamaming SH selaku Ketua Umum Himpunan Pengusaha Muda Indonesia. Seminar Internasional akan menghadirkan pemateri dari tiga benua yang berbeda. Profesor Abraham L. Wagner, Research Assistant Professor Department of Epidemiology University of Michigan, USA. Profesor Hitsin Chow Yang, Research Fellow at Institute of Statistical Science, Academia Sinica, Taiwan. 
and Professor Sebastian Fulmer, Development Economics Professor, University of Göttingen, Jerman. Data Science Competition merupakan kompetisi mengolah, menganalisis, dan mempresentasikan data bagi siswa SMA sederajat seluruh Indonesia dengan total hadiah sebesar 6 juta rupiah. Lomba Desain Infografis akan menjadi wadah bagi mahasiswa Indonesia untuk meningkatkan kemampuan menyajikan data dalam bentuk poster dengan total hadiah sebesar 6 juta 750 ribu rupiah. Pelatihan software Python akan menghadirkan pemateri Hendra Darmawan, salah seorang pegawai Badan Pusat Statistik Provinsi Aceh, dan juga mahasiswa S2 Institut Pertanian Bogor. Dan Roma Isak Ruba, salah satu mahasiswi S3 Statistika Institut Teknologi 10 November. Statistic Explore 2021, data sign for SDGs, are innovative road of ecosocial tech, supported by Dewan Perwakilan Daerah Republik Indonesia, Bank Aceh, and Bank Syariah Indonesia. Media Partner Umas dan Protokol Setda Aceh, Umas Universitas Syah Kuala, Ozit Radio 102,8 FM Banda Aceh, Sejuta Cita, Statistika Zone, and UKM Persetutan.